have to bar six duly elected government members from office uh, and taking away at least two seats from the Iraqia list. So these events were before the recent escalation in violence in the last few days, but of course they were moves made by the Iraqi government itself. So once again, Iraqis are compelled to go through these electoral processes to retrospectively justify Western barbarism, fully aware that the outcome will be more violence, more destruction, and a further rationale for deferring US military withdrawal. As if the selection of these corrupt elites in any case would have any bearing on the reality of everyday life, as a selection of recent headlines suggests. State food aid, pack state food aid package slash. Iraqi refugees still suffering seven years on, Middle East Online. Iraq saw a rising death toll in March. 1,400 checkpoints inside the Iraqi capital from Hazaran. Baba Musa inquiry, eight more civilians died in British custody. British military intelligence ran renegade torture unit in Iraq. Marine to face court martial for the 24 killings of Iraqi civilians. Fallujah doctor reports rising birth defects and obviously original Additional research published in the American Journal of Public Health uh, indicates a spike in leukemia in the Basra region uh, related to war related nerve agents and pesticides, as well as DU. But the most common word you find in headlines about Iraq is fraud. Voter fraud, government fraud, private contractor fraud, financial fraud. America's re revamped Iraq is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. But the biggest fraud, of course, is the Western theft of Iraq's resources by Halliburton, BP, and others. And then the headline, Blair strikes oil in Iraq. Middle East Online reporting, in three years since he stepped down as Prime Minister, Blair has pocketed more than $30 million in oil revenues from his secret dealings with the South Korean oil consortium, UI Energy Corporation. <coughs> What's clear from these headlines is that Iraq is not invisible. Its problems still make the headlines, but the occupation itself is rarely seen as worthy of mention. It doesn't fit the Obama narrative. I wrote recently, Barack Obama's administration has renamed its activities in the country, Operation New Dawn. Despite promising to withdraw all troops by August of this year, there remain nearly 100,000 US troops in Iraq, not counting mercenary contractors, and General Raymond Odierno, the top US commander in Iraq, is exploiting the dire security situation to demand that combat brigades be kept on past this deadline. In a typical smoke and mirror, uh, a year ago, for, uh, for foreign policy in focus, uh, under an article entitled A Withdrawal in Name Only, after listing all the loopholes in the State of Forces Agreement signed in late 2008, the analysis said, instead of sending soldiers stationed in cities home, the military has been expanding and building bases in rural areas to accommodate soldiers affected by the June 30th deadline. And Congress just passed a war spending bill that includes more funding for military construction inside Iraq. And the point of all this is to underline the relevance of our campaign, Justice for Iraq. This was launched two years ago at a meeting organized by Iraq Occupation Focus, and it was one of a number of international initiatives inspired by the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research, whose board member Hans von Sponek was formerly UN Humanitarian Coordinator. It issued an important paper on the future of Iraq, observing, quote, the invasion and ongoing occupation is a political, intellectual, and moral disaster, a withdrawal that leaves Iraq at its own fate without any war reparations, opportunities for social political healing, aid, and so on, would be another. The, address, the issues we wanted to address included what should happen to the tens of thousands of Iraqis, including children, still detained with no prospect of legal process. Who will clear up the cluster bombs and depleted uranium warheads, which in heavily bombarded areas such as Fallujah, have caused a huge increase in birth defects? How can Iraq extricate itself from oil extraction contracts signed away by its puppet government <coughs> and return to full sovereignty over its economic affairs? What can be done to heal the trauma whose long-term effects distort the development of all post-conflict societies so violently? What kind of financial compensation should the perpetrators pay for their illegal and immoral occupation? So we launched the campaign Justice for Iraq, and its five demands, I think, are included in the material that you have. An immediate end to the occupation, address the humanitarian crisis, an end to foreign interference in Iraq's affairs, including its oil industry, compensation for reparations, and prosecution of all those responsible for war crimes, 
human rights abuses and the theft <coughs> of Iraq's resources. None of these issues have been addressed in the last two years. The British government's approach of withdraw and forget, fully supported by appliant mainstream media, has made it difficult to generate a campaign around these essential demands. Additionally, the diminishing numbers of anti-war activists inevitably means that the more urgent issues get prioritised. And in America as well, of course, the anti-war movement is weaker, partly due to the uh, disastrous decision by many uh, to subordinate their independence to the Obama campaign, whose new militarism uh, now needs them paralysed to uh, strengthen their movement. But if Iraq is no longer capable of mobilising hundreds or thousands, hundreds of thousands on the streets, there are still significant opportunities to advance our agenda. And what we have here, I think, is a platform of knowledge and expertise around these issues. And we must continue to generate and disseminate our ideas to the thousands in the form of things we've done already, the IOF fortnightly newsletter, our blog, our website, and working uh, with sympathetic friends in Parliament. Conferences like this, with the participation of the Stop the War Coalition, are hugely important. The Brussels Tribunal is a brilliant initiative. And it's partly down to our work and your persistence that Tony Blair remains a discredited liar and that the issue continues to make new headlines and the government's forced to hold new inquiries. The question is that how do we take our campaign to the next level? Clearly, we're in the run-up to a general election. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are just one of many topics that the political elite does not want to talk about. Even the debate about cutting the government's budget deficits, none of them want to talk about getting out of these wars or scrapping weapon systems and so on. But ordinary people, of course, are not so easily fooled. Millions of people are talking about political issues, many for the first time. And we can inject our agenda into this debate. Tony Blair recently made a speech in his former constituency of Sedgefield. He was painted by anti-war activists. And this is how it's going to be. Writing recently in The Guardian, the novelist Sue Townsend said that she, quote, wept with tears of shame. I wonder, she said, if Blair was sitting on a sofa with his family watching shop and all. Could he look his children in the eye when the transmission was over? I have never recovered from the shock of that night. I have been told my fixation with Blair and his involvement with the invasion of Iraq is unhealthy. It was all back in the day. Get over it. Move forward. But I can't, unquote. Neither can thousands of others who want to see Blair held to account and even tried for war crimes. And we should be there every time he tries to speak in this election campaign, demanding he face prosecution. And we should call on Labour candidates to have nothing to do with him and that he should not be rehabilitated. And there are a few others worth seeking out as well. Uh, for example, Malcolm Rifkin, who's the Conservative MP in this town down the road in Kensington, who headed Armour Group, which until its recent takeover made millions and millions of pounds profit providing mercenary contractors to Iraq. And we should go after the corporations as well that made and continue to make money out of Iraq. Companies like Group 4 Security hired to pro provide the British Army with security in southern Iraq, but also accused of provoking a riot at Yarl's Wood Detention Centre a few years ago. Companies like De La Rue, which got the $120 million contract to print Iraq's new currency, paid for by Iraq's oil revenues. It was printed in Basingstoke and flown in on 27 specially chartered flights. The Iraqi government had no control over the process. So Jeremy Greenstock, the so-called Deputy Viceroy in Iraq, in the first two years of the occupation is on the board. And all of these companies have offices just down the road, a few streets away. And we should ask all the candidates in this election whether they stand on our demands, the millions of displaced people, the need for reparations, the prosecution, not just of a few soldiers, but those who authorised war, aerial bombardment, the torture of civilians. And we should publicise their answers in the local press, on our blogs, websites, in press releases to the national media, and so forth. And it's worth saying, in my experience, MPs on these issues are approachable, not all the time, but some of the time, and particularly at this time in an election. Some are honest, some are scoundrels, but most are ignorant. And if we could get the knowledge and understanding that we have in this room today into their field of vision, I believe it could make a huge difference. And after the election, there will be the Chilcot Report. And like previous reports, it will make criticisms of the way the war was authorised and conducted. But there must be consequences. If the war was illegal, unjustified or wrong, what about holding those responsible to account? What about compensation for the millions whose lives were disrupted and ruined? And this provides us with a focus for public meetings, press work, legal initiatives, and a range of activities that can advance our campaign. So we have to take our ideas forward wherever the opportunity presents itself, developing our expertise, publicizing the issues, briefing MPs, strengthening our ties with international co-thinkers, and building our platform. 
No one else will do this. No one else will do this. Only the people in this room and their co-thinkers can take this forward. And so we carry on. We may no longer have hundreds of thousands on the streets, but we have their tacit backing and goodwill. Polls now show a majority of people want the complete end to military occupation, and 40% are angry that it ever happened. The support for our work is real and deep-rooted, and it has continued to encourage and inspire us in the struggles ahead. Thank you.